On this edition of Native Report, Komodos can experience the construction of a traditional structure known as a wigwam. We then meet Russell Northrup and his family as they finish building the wigwam. We also learn what we can do to lead healthier lives and hear from our elders on this edition of Native Report. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Blandin Foundation, the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation, and the Shakopee Midwakanton Sioux Community. Welcome to the premiere episode of our 15th season of Native Report. I'm Ernie Stevens. And I'm Rita Aspinwall. Our first story is a response to a viewer inquiry about wigwams, the traditional dome-shaped structure used by many Native American nations across North America. We sought out an individual who has built many, and join us now as we head into the forest of northern Minnesota, where we collect the materials needed to start the build. We're on our way through the forest on the Fond du Lac Reservation to a stand of ironwood trees, some of which will be harvested for the making of a wigwam. Birch bark had already been harvested during the spring, and now it's time to collect other materials needed to build this traditional structure. But before any cutting is done, tobacco is put out as an offering to the tree. It's very important to acknowledge the ones that were here before us in a good way. So tobacco is very powerful uh, to use as the first plant um, given to Anishinaabe and we use it in such with reverence and honor. Uh, we, we set that down in a, in a careful way um, to ask for permission that we come into these uh, forests, these woods in a good way um, to harvest the ironwood tree. We're following uh, the, the customs and traditions of our Nindanakobi uh, Jigananik, our uh, the ones that come before us, our great grandparents, and we want to have it in place for uh, the future one. Gay on that, there's ones that are yet to come. So, uh, in this fashion, um, tobacco is used in a good way. We do these things not just for Anishinaabe people, but all peoples, in respect for. Uh, other living beings and the interdependence that we have with uh, other um, beings and on our uh, Mother Earth. In the past, the Fond du Lac Cultural Center and Museum has done similar projects such as this one. The Reservation Business Committee, the governing body of the nation, commissioned band member Russell Northrup to construct this wigwam, which is also called a waganagan. He has built several over the years. Well, we've done um, quite a few waganagans, as these lodges are called over the years. Uh, we've done uh, a bunch of uh, traditional Ojibwe birch bark canoe making, and then we always would do that inside a waganagan lodge. So we've built a few of these in the past and used them as teaching uh, tools and site, teaching sites. Eventually what we'll be doing is making some curriculum, language curriculum. Well, a lot of people have to understand the knowledge you need of your natural environment just to know where to find some of these resources like all of the birch bark or the specific types of woods that we use to make these lodges. That's all knowledge that um, you need to keep in your community and for the future. Technology today is based on the knowledge of the past. So Russ, what exactly are you looking for when you're... I'm just looking for them straight, pretty straight, you know. Early spring I went and collected the bark and got everything necessary to, to build it. Well, it took roughly about, to cut the bark about six hours a day. I was getting six 
six, seven pieces, you know, going out and finding the, the ones I was going to use, so, and going out and cutting them, and it took six to eight hours there. We collected about 50 pieces of ironwood, about one inch in diameter. Uh, that took roughly a three, four hours cutting and trimming them up. Typically, the inner bark of the basswood tree would also be harvested, and thin strips would be used to lash together the ironwood poles and to attach the birch bark to the frame. But for this project, Russ will instead use twine. Much work goes into gathering the materials needed for the build. It was late in the season to get the uh, Weegis. And, so, and Weegis is what? Um, basswood bark, inner bark, used for tying, uh, securing things. So where did you learn how to make uh, uh, this structure then? Uh, I don't know how many years back it was, but I went and helped some people in the Madea grounds. Uh, rebuild theirs up in Mille Lacs and they needed help putting one up and so I went up there and volunteered and I got the idea you know that hey I could I could do that you know well when we help uh, our community keep cultural arts alive they keep our traditions alive we have a legacy of a very wonderful tribal history. We have a legacy of all kinds of tribal uh, foods and management, ways of managing the land. And these are time-tested, millennial-old activities that are still pertinent today and knowledge that should not be lost. I was supposed to take a sauna this morning with my friend Steve and uh, at exactly 8 o'clock I could feel some fullness up in here and my left arm didn't feel good um, and it didn't hurt, I didn't have any chest pain but maybe a little bit shorter breath but apprehensive, a little bit of a headache right up in here still have that a little bit of a neck ache in the back of my neck and uh, and it, it just came out all of a sudden and it was something I was hoping it was going to go away and then I checked my pulse I could feel my pulse and I could feel it was fast and irregular and I checked my blood pressure I have a blood pressure machine at home my, my blood pressure was actually low it was uh, it should be 130 over 80 or less it was the first one was 96 over 75 and my heart rate was 136 by that. And I checked it again and it was, my blood pressure was a little bit higher, but my pulse was still 136. And uh, it was my day off and my wife asked, are you gonna take me to lunch? And I said, how about instead you take me to the emergency room? And she brought me in and my pulse rate remained high. Atrial fibrillation is the thing that Hopefully, it just resolves on its own, but sometimes it doesn't. And um, and they waited here. They got labs and my troponin, which is the thing that is from heart muscle. If that goes up, it means that you've had damage to your heart, heart attack, and that was zero. Uh, my thyroid test was fine. My other tests were fine. With think of a CBC, a complete blood count, that was fine. That would show infection or anemia, and um, and all of that stuff was fine. And um, we came in here and they started an IV and got blood work and, and checked my thyroid and all that stuff. And, um, and then we should have taken some video of that, the things that went on before the cardio version IV. My wife left during that, but she was only gone for about two minutes and they put me out. And I'm mostly back already. Um, and so they put, they put a pad here, a big sticky pad up here. 
big sticky one here. They're still here. I got tons of monitor leads and stuff. And they shock my heart. And atrial fibrillation is when the top part of the heart is, it, normally it, it, the top part squeezes and it fills the bottom and then the bottom part squeezes. And it's just a nice ballet. It's just this rhythm that just keeps happening and happening. And it, the, the each side, there's the right side and the left side that does it. The right side pumps blood into your lungs, the left side pumps it to your body. Atrial fibrillation, instead of a single pacemaker that's squeezing that heart and then allowing the bottom part to fill and then that happening, there, the top part is it gets a bunch of other pacemakers. It gets irritated and then the, the top part of the heart is just wiggling like a bowl of jello. And, um, and then some of the impulses get through and then the bottom part beats. And sometimes a few get through and sometimes nothing and then sometimes another one. And then you get with this really irregular heartbeat, but usually it's fast. And 60 to 100 is normal adult resting heart rate, minus 136. Um, it went up to 148 here briefly. And um, so everybody came in, started an IV, got labs. They gave me some time to wait and see if, if I just would go out of this spontaneously, and I didn't. So um, they gave me some sedation, and they shocked my heart. So when the top part was wiggling like that, and the bottom part was beating once in a while, they just stunned it, and just, and and then that my normal pacemaker took off, and and then my heart's beating normally now. So it's beating in a regular rhythm. So I'll probably have to get my blood pressure medicine switched. Uh, I want one that works really well for my blood pressure. I tolerate it fine, but it won't help my heart rate. So there are some other ones that can help my heart not go uh, into that rhythm and keep it from from going. But the cardioversion, the shock, they gave me some propofol, which is an anesthetic. They knocked me out. I remember absolutely nothing about that. The, the emergency room doctor was talking to me, and then he was saying, are you feeling okay? Are you tired? And I thought they were worried that I was getting tired, but he was asking me if I was okay after the anesthesia and after the cardioversion. So that didn't hurt at all. I don't remember nothing, anything about that. And um, so I don't even know what time it is. That was, it happened at 8 o'clock this morning. We were in here by 8.40 or so. Um, I think they did the cardio version at 10 after 10. And, and, uh, yes, I'd be, I can take you to lunch. Atrial fibrillation is a serious heart problem. The real risk of atrial fibrillation is having a stroke. When the heart is beating regularly, blood moves through the heart efficiently. When the heart is beating irregularly, blood can pool in the atrium. Blood that isn't moving starts to clot, and these clots can break loose. The aorta is the blood vessel coming out of the heart, and the first two blood vessels branching off the aorta go to the brain. A clot can lodge in an artery in the brain, and the part of the brain supplied by that artery can't get oxygen, and it dies, and this is a stroke. Only about a third of people with atrial fibrillation see it as dangerous, and they are at risk for strokes and heart failure. Age increases the risk of atrial fibrillation, and so does long-standing uncontrolled high blood pressure. Diabetes, asthma, hyperthyroidism, and binge drinking all increase the risk of going into atrial fibrillation. Untreated sleep apnea isn't proven to cause atrial fibrillation, but studies show a strong link between them. Underlying heart disease, including heart valve problems, history of previous heart attacks, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, and history of heart surgery all increase the risk of going into atrial fibrillation. Once someone is diagnosed with atrial fibrillation, treatment plans depend on the risk of having a stroke. The CHADS-VASC risk score will decide whether you need to be anticoagulated with warfarin, aspirin, or one of the newer direct-acting oral anticoagulants, or DOACs. The score is based on congestive heart failure, hypertension, or 140 over 90 on two readings, or if someone's on blood pressure medicines, age of 75 or greater gets two points, diabetes is a point, a stroke prior episode scores two points, vascular disease, meaning a prior heart attack, peripheral arterial disease, or aortic plaque. Age 65 to 74 scores a point, 
and female sex scores a point. Anyone with a score of two or greater should be on anticoagulants to prevent strokes. It matters how long someone has been in atrial fibrillation and if treatments to convert to a normal sinus rhythm are successful. The treatments can include trying to get the heart back into a normal rhythm with medications, catheter ablation procedures, cardioversion, or surgery. Some people are permanently in atrial fibrillation and need to be on medications to control their heart rate and anticoagulation if they meet the criteria. The guidelines for atrial fibrillation are about 170 pages long and you need to discuss the best course of action with your health care provider. Remember to call an elder. They've been waiting for your call. I'm Dr. Arnie Vainio. I'm happy to be here and this is Health Matters. Can you tell me who um, taught you how to make the faceless dolls? My grandma. My grandma was born on Madeline Island. She taught me and my cousin at the same time. And we asked her why it didn't have a face on it. And uh, we lived up on top of the hill and then there was a creek that ran around the hall, you know, around the hill. So she took us by the hand and walked us down there and she knelt by the creek and she said, we, she looked into the creek and we, well, we did too, because we were only five. And <clears throat> we asked her why there was no faces. And she says, well, whose face should I take from the water spirits? And we, all, we had already known that legend because she had told it to us that that's the only place your face, your image is supposed to be is in the water. In tonight's first segment, we ventured into the forest of northern Minnesota to collect building materials for the construction of a wigwam. Next, we learn how this is often a multi-generational affair and a great way for Russell Northrup to hand down traditional Ojibwe teachings to his children and grandchildren. It is the morning after Russell Northrup and several other Fond du Lac Reservation band members okay. harvested ironwood poles needed to construct a wigwam, and today they will begin the build. The chosen site for the wigwam is a field adjacent to the Fond du Lac Language House. The first step is to determine the size. Well, we needed more cultural settings in the area, and this seemed to... Uh... I had an idea, I built a couple more earlier, and uh, they wanted to expand their cultural, so I approached them with the idea of building a wigwam out here on the language grounds. This one here is approximately uh, 12 by 15 feet. I had my family come and, come and help me. I had my grandson Julius. and. My daughter, Naomi, my other grandson, Cade, and my wife, Deb. I try to teach my my kids and grandkids, you know, about the way of life, you know, we live, you know, um, from maple sugar on to this, you know. I ain't going to be around forever, I told them, and so somebody has to carry on these things, you know, and you got to learn it. And so they've been going along with me and collecting bark and collecting ironwood and learning the steps involved into creating something like this, you know. So I feel it's going to continue on. Once the perimeter of the wigwam or waganagan is outlined, the next step is to pound holes in which the ironwood poles will be situated for the frame. To be able to be able to uh, keep some of these activities alive and also be able to benefit from the use of the land and a lot of our natural and wild foods. So I like to be able to let folks have the knowledge that it takes to be able to do some of these types of traditional activities because uh, you can still use them in the present and in the future. 
created some at home. We have ceremonies for our kids. Um, when they're first born, you know, they have to touch the ground in the first four days. Uh, we created one at home, it was a larger size, it was, wasn't birch bark, we just used tarp and insulation and um, it was uh, 15 by 30, we had it heated in the winter. My grandson was born on the 5th of January, so he was able to touch the ground without freezing. When I started making them, you know, I, you're able to sit back and look at it and you hear stories from from your elders and from, well, people older than me that you know your grandparents were were born in one of these, and uh, so then you start figuring out how you're going to make it. You know how did how did they make it? You know how did they insulate it? How did they keep warm in the winter? You know all these things going through your mind, and you're starting to figure you know how to, how it's going to work, and that's how I. That's how I created this project, I mean, what I'm doing right now. The poles are then bent toward the middle and tied together using twine. Basswood strips would normally be used, but the twine will work just as good. With the frame complete, it is now time to add birch bark panels to build up the walls around the wigwam or waganagan. It's a ground up process as the panels must overlap to protect the inside from the outside elements. The Fond du Lac Cultural Center and Museum documented the build from start to finish. How does that make you feel when you, you have your uh, daughter involved, your wife, uh, your grandsons? How does that make you feel? I'm proud of them that they, they could put up with me. <laughs> um, they're doing a good, they do a good job, you know, they're they pick up pretty fast and they know what I want, you know, it's it's almost like they try to read my mind what's next, you know, and they they keep me motivated. My granddaughter my daughter keeps me motivated. Well let's keep going, keep going. I can't take breaks, so that's the way it works out, you know, and I I enjoy that, the pushing. She pushes the grandsons and her son. I wanted to show our show the grandkids that it's alright, you know. You know, there's no two alike. You know, you can go to different reservations, you'll see them different, made differently. You know, and um, that's what I told the grandkids, you know, be proud of what you do. Trust in your work, you know. I could have them crawl all the way across the top of one of these. And, um, you know, I said, you know, that's you having faith in yourself and what you're doing. And so it's mostly teaching the kids to have faith in themselves. So we like to keep a lot of these cultural arts alive. Personally, it, it makes me feel really good because we work hard as a Fond du Lac family. So it's a big plus for us personally, and it's a big plus as a, commu in a, as a community also. It's a process on building, you know. It's believing in yourself that you could do something. You look at your look at your history and you know this is where your family came from you know you had grandparents born in these you had parents born in these be proud of where you came from and these were homes these were our homes and this is where we grew up A bridge project just south of Duluth will begin again from scratch after construction work disturbed an Indian cemetery. Native Report aired the initial story about the burial site in season 13. In mid-May 2017, the Minnesota Department of Transportation began work on a project to replace the Highway 23 bridge over Mission Creek to allow for a larger waterway. Due to the inadvertent disturbance of a Native American burial site in June 2017, the Mission Creek Bridge replacement project was placed on hold. In collaboration with the Fond du Lac Band of Lakes Superior Chippewa, Minnesota Indian Affairs Council, and the Office of the State Archaeologist, MnDOT has since worked to help respectfully complete burial recovery and restore the cemetery site. In early October 2019, it was announced that the burial recovery process had been completed and processed soils could begin being returned to the cemetery. 
In November 2019, processed soils were returned and the central cemetery slope was stabilized. In 2014, the most recent report available, the state archaeologist investigated 14 burial cases, 11 of them Indian burial sites, and authenticated four previously unrecorded cemeteries. MnDOT has contracted with a landscape architect to develop a final design for restoring the historic cemetery site. Outreach for input on the final cemetery design is ongoing and restoration efforts will begin in the summer of 2020. The effort has cost more than $6 million so far, including the construction work that had been completed. For more information about Native Report or the stories we've covered, look for us on the web at nativereport.org, on Facebook, and on YouTube. Thank you for spending this time with your friends and neighbors across Indian Country. I'm Rita Aspinwall. And I'm Ernie Stevens. We'll see you next time on Native Report. Rita Aspinwall is an enrolled member of the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa and is an ICWA social worker with Fond du Lac Social Services. Ernie Stevens is a member of the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin and is a film and television producer. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Blandin Foundation, the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation, and the Shakopee Midwakanton Sioux Community.